Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions – Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love Group and is part of the Education and Love series. In the introduction presentation, Jesus introduces the Education and Love Assistance Groups by talking about the source of our education and love. God's definition of love in comparison to humankind's definition and provides an overview of the coming week. Recorded on the 5th of March 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Yeah. How are we? Good this morning? Awesome. All rare in to go? Yes. Yep. Good day. All right. Um, I'll just leave it a minute or so and then we get started just in case we have stragglers. Everyone, is everyone here, Joy, do you know? Or is there still some, still some cards left on the table there, isn't there? So there was some left, uh, left last night too, wasn't there? You've put them back out again. If you can make sure if you haven't got your uh, card, it's handy, it's handy for myself but it's also handy for the person who's doing the filming because they, you know, know your name and so forth um, as well. And after, after a few days we get used to names and so forth, which is really good. And some of you I haven't met before. So for those of you I haven't met before, welcome. Um, and uh, we're probably not going to get too much chance to get to know each other, unfortunately, during, the, during these sessions. But at least you'll get to know how to uh, get to know God better, <laughs> which is the most important thing. All right. Um, to start off this morning, what I would like you to do just for a moment is to close your eyes and imagine that you're blind. So you can't see anything, no colour, there's no shapes, no colour, anything. You can hear and you can smell. You can taste, fortunately, otherwise you probably wouldn't be too attracted to eating. <laughs> but uh, you can taste, smell, obviously feel, but you can't see. Right. And you're thirsty. And you don't know where any water is and, and you don't know how to get to the water anyway. But you do hear people around you. So there are people around you, you can hear them and unfortunately sometimes smell them. <laughs> and, uh, but you can hear them and... But you can't see them. So, so you, you lay out. Is anyone, anyone around me who knows where some water is? And this guy comes up to you, touches you on your arm and just says, um, yeah, I can help you. I, I can lead you to some water. What would be the very first question or the very first statement you might make to him, do you think? Any ideas? Alex, thanks. How we go? Uh, down, down, um, leave your hand up, Alex, because otherwise Chris can't see you. Yep. Always leave your hand up because the people who are doing the mics don't know you necessarily. Um, the first feeling I had was that, can I trust him? Yeah, a lot of you would probably have that feeling, but that's not the question you need to ask. <laughs> and if we go down over across across to this side, just yeah, to the back, I can't. Um, I'd be grateful and say thank you. You'd say thank you? He hasn't done anything yet though. <laughs> He's only made a promise, <laughs> hasn't he? If we come down to diet. I'd probably ask how far away it is. Right, okay. If he knows what he's doing, it doesn't really matter, does it? As long as you get a, water, a drink, Cardi. Cardi, yeah. yeah no. Just leave your hand up, Cardi, because Chris's got no idea who you are. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Um, um, how do I find it? How do you find it? Yeah, well, all these questions tell me that you're not very logical because there's a very logical question you need to probably ask him. Jennifer, you have an idea? Yeah. Who are you? No, I don't think that's relevant really. It doesn't really matter, does it? Teresa, you want to have a go? Can I drink this water? No, I wouldn't ask that either. Seth just had a brainstorm. Let's see if she's right. 
I was going to say that I just trust my feeling. Oh, okay. No, that's not the brainstorm you need to have. Can I, can I stop the pain? <laughs> Three little words. <laughs> the most logical thing to ask him. If he can't see, how can he lead you to anything? You're blind. And if he can't see and he's blind, then <laughs> what good is that? <laughs> can you see? Can you see? Yeah. I just <laughs> we make these assumptions, but it's the most logical question to ask him, isn't it? Can you see? In the first century, I made a statement and I said, well, and, and it's based on my experience in the first century, and that was I saw many blind people leading many blind people. And as a result, I said to them, both of them fell into the pit. And this is the problem with your education at the moment. You've been led by blind people. And because you yourselves are often quite blind, when it, particularly when it comes to an education in love, you both fall in the pit. And this is a big issue. And it's an issue I want to discuss with you as a part of our introduction. You see, we're here to gain an education in love, aren't we? So we're here to be educated in love, but to be educated requires somebody knowing more than what you do about a subject, does it not? If somebody knows exactly the same as you do about a certain subject, then, then it's highly unlikely they'll be able to educate you. All right. So, so many, how many of you have gone to university or higher education of some kind? Right. So good, well, probably three quarters of the audience. And, um, and how many of you have uh, like, had a trade or a, some kind of, you know, apprenticeship of some kind? So few, fewer, yes. Often that's more effective than going to university, <laughs> particularly in the world we live in. But, uh, and there's fewer and fewer, unfortunately, doing a trade. But either way, you're reliant on somebody knowing more than you do about that particular subject, aren't you? Otherwise, it's pointless going and getting that particular education. So the question then becomes, why, well, if we're going to be educated in love, who are we going to be educated by? Now, the majority of you have had an education in love based upon the world's education in love. The world and your family of origin has educated you in what they believe love to be. Since that's the case, it's highly unlikely you will rise any higher than the world itself in terms of your education, particularly your education in love. So let's look at what the world has. If you compare what the world has, you see a lot of trouble and trauma. The average people do not have successful marriages or, or relationships. The average people don't have very successful lives. The average people are running from one addiction to another in order to get some sense of satisfaction and enjoyment. The average people have all these different issues and problems that they have to face. And then we get old and we get diseases and, and we usually die with one or both of those particular things. Um, it all sounds to me like if that's the hope that we have, then getting educated from the world is, is a pretty pointless thing because it's like the blind leading the blind. So I'd like to just tell you a little bit about my experience in the first century with my own personal education. Because uh, my father, um, soon after I was born, believed myself to be the coming Messiah foretold in, in the scriptures. And even though he believed those particular things, um, he wasn't very cluey when it comes to getting an education from a higher source. And while now he has an education from a higher source, he's now in a soul union state with my mother, and back in the first century, obviously, he wasn't. So he, he, was, he was an educated man himself, and he also had a trade. He was also a man who wanted to become a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin at some point in his future, and he planned a lot of his life in order for that to occur. So he made sure he was education in the Torah, and the prophets, as were the general, the Pharisees of the day, were generally educated. Because of that... Um, from a very young age, he sent me to a school. But before then, um, 
you know, when I was just growing up, younger than five, what you would say, in my fifth year now, uh, back then, um, you would say that's four years of age nowadays, but back then we used to call it in our fifth year, like in our sixth year or so forth. And, and so we, uh, I was uh, placed in my, in my fifth year in a school for, um, that, that was a part of the temple in the, in the area in which we lived, and we lived in a place which was near the, the start of the delta of the Nile in Egypt remembering that my father took me there after I was born because he was afraid about, uh, about myself being killed um, by some Jewish soldiers of Herod. So he, he took me there and, and, and we stayed there until I was 12 years of age in, in that region. So when, when I was quite young, um, I can remember the very first person I ever felt talking to me. And, and I want to say feel talking to me, I, it's the only way I could describe it because, because re in reality was I just felt this loving presence, spe speaking in the sense of not with words but with feelings, and and with myself the very first words I ever learnt was to talk back, so that my very first words I ever spoke were to this presence who who was talking to me. I felt talking to me. And, uh, and this presence was a very loving and benevolent presence. Um, I didn't know who, who it was at the time. But by the time I was three years of age, I could see spirit, uh, spirits around me, well, from the time of birth, really, but I started noticing them as people around me by, at that age. And, and none of those people were this benevolent presence. So I could see a lot of people that other people couldn't see, just like most children today can do a similar thing. And so I could see the ones talking to me, and, and there were quite some nice people talking to me, and they claimed to be people like Moses and Eli Elias, Elijah, and 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 David, King David of of old people that I later came to know in my in my examination of what was what you would classify now as the Bible, but back then as what we believed were the holy verses or holy scriptures, and. And in that process, uh, I had, so I had these people talking to me who were benevolent. Then I had these other people around me at times who were very malevolent. You know, I could see they were quite nasty people. They were people that other people couldn't see. So I started to see that while I could see them, other people couldn't for some reason, <coughs> although other children could. Other adults couldn't see them. And I also started receiving some education from these people, these, these people who were um, what I came to know as spirits who, who, who had died before my life began. So here I am now, I've got, uh, I've got this benevolent presence that I can't see, that I'm receiving information from, and talking to. And, and, and unfortunately, um, I would probably, uh, most of the time I talk to him out loud, <laughs> which uh, displeased my father greatly because he thought, you know, I was, just had an imaginary friend of some kind. And uh, as I grew, by the time I was five years of age, my father was very, very concerned about this, and, I, and his concern led me to talk to this benevolent being not out loud anymore <laughs> in my head. But I'd still get the feelings as replies and so forth and get educated on all sorts of things. Mostly at that stage it was things to do with things that I would discover in my day-to-day -day play. You know, with, with down on the Nile River, and there was lots of opportunities to learn about different things, and I used to be down there a lot. Um, my family, by this stage, had two other children, and so my mother had two very young children, so she didn't really know where I was most of the time, and my father was building a business, so he didn't really know where I was most of the time, and so I spent a lot of my time alone, playing down, down on the river, but sometimes with other friends, sometimes not. And so my father decides that he needs to educate me because I am the so-called coming Messiah, although now he's a little worried about my sanity. <laughs> but uh, so he, he puts me in what you would classify nowadays as a school, but it's run by religious leaders uh, in a building that is like, like a, what you would classify today as a mosque or a temple or something like that. It's, it's just a... Uh, it's really just an auditorium with some basic um, religious icons in it 
for worship, uh, where we would go for worship, but the school would also be held there. And I, along with other children of my age, uh, in various ages actually, would be educated there. The process, we got educated in the Torah and the prophets of the Bible, what's now known as the Bible. Back then, of course, we didn't know it like that. And, and many of the things that I read, I could feel this benevolent prison, presence telling me things that that were true and quite frequently I would be amazed by the revelations and sometimes I'd even cry which also was a problem because back then of course a, a boy crying was a major issue and and particularly for my father because I, I would sometimes feel like be moved to tears by what I read particularly what I read in the prophets and he would he would be concerned about that. So, so, so what he did was when I was seven years of age, he decided to send me to a school, another school, another education. But this one wasn't so good for me. So what happened was it, this school was uh, run by what you would classify as ex-Roman soldiers. And it was for young boys um, of the more aristocratic, I suppose you'd classify them as class, to be educated in warfare and how to handle themselves physically uh, in warfare. So we were educated in using the sword and using other, other you know, items as well. Now, I quite enjoyed the physical parts of it because uh, I enjoyed you know, any physical activity at the time. But uh, in my second year there, I was eight years of age. And, and by the way, this is a very similar experience to Corny that Corny had from the time of around three or four years of age, right the way through his entire life until he entered the Roman army. So for him, he had that experience that went on for years and years and years and years of systematic indoctrination and, and actually quite severe abuse. Uh, whereas for myself, it, it lasted the first year or so, and then we were in our second year of that, and then they started introducing uh, some girls into the program. These girls were the children of the women who would look after the the school, I suppose you would call it, it's just a number of rooms in a in a house, um, and or in a number of houses in a row that were built for specifically for the purpose of educating children to become adult warriors, and. And in that process, there would be women, women who, you know, obviously looked after the beds and, and the linen and, and the cooking and the cleaning. But unfortunately, um, they were also forced into looking after sexually the, the men in the, uh, who, who were running the, cam the camp, I suppose you would classify it as. And, and they would often have children and, and the boy children would become a part of the indoctrination process of the other boys and the girl children would become a part of the process of what you would nowadays call psychological warfare against people. And, and that was focused primarily on the sexual side of warfare. And, and in that regard, what happened was they would, the children would be educated into how to abuse girls uh, sexually and emotionally and and these were boys eight years of age who were being educated that way right? and it still upsets me um, because um, the, in particular one occasion there was a there was a young girl uh, who was about nine years of age at the time she was and 14 boys I was forced into watching 14 boys harm her sexually <laughs> And, and that was fairly difficult to watch and, and to, to cope with for me. So much so that I, I didn't want to go there anymore and I left there and went home because um, it was a little way, I walked home. And, um, and my father tried to force me to go back but, but I, I couldn't go back. But it still upsets me a bit because I couldn't stop what happened either. So there was that feeling that I just couldn't protect her as well. Fortunately that girl now, uh, I did find that girl after I passed in the spirit world and that girl now is a celestial spirit so she obviously um, obviously has been helped since but, but she wasn't helped while she was on earth. But there's my, there's my education so I'm now starting to learn the negative side effects of education as well, the, the harmful side effects of education. Yep. If you'd like to ask. Hi, AJ. Thank you for that um, description there. I'm a little bit confused and concerned 
and don't really understand why not more children and people have had the... Um, You're asking a question way off topic. Sorry. So we need to skip it. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so, so, what we, so what I'm trying to get at here is that, is that my, that two years of experience showed me the really negative parts of education, how we can be educated negatively and, and <coughs> actually into a state of a lot of harm and distress. Does that make sense? Um, but also how, you know, my earlier education, which was in the, more like in these, what you would classify as, you know, like auditoriums or temples, if you like, that, that education was much more pleasant because it connected me more to my feelings and connected me more to God and so forth. And my education before then, which was primarily through the spirit assistance that I was receiving along with this benevolent presence that I could feel, which I came to understand was actually God. But, but it, it, I came to understand that later, and not, not at the time. But, but that presence of the education I received in those re that regard was quite pleasant and good. But not only that, far exceeded the, the people um, ability to understand at the time. Does that make sense? So, so here I am now, I'm, I'm eight or nine years of age now. I'm quite resistive now to the negative education. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm very focused now on trying to res continue receiving my positive education, even though I was now back in the temple-based schools. Um, I was now receiving a positive education, I felt also mostly from my spirit friends and from this benevolent presence, the source I felt of all true, or of all truth and all education. And the reason why I say this to you is that is that one thing I realised by the time I was that age was that it is pointless getting an education from people who do not know. Because it's the same as the blind leading the blind. You both are going to get to the stage where you fall, where, where you fall over. So, so what do we need to do if we're going to receive an education at some stage we all have to get to that point where we have the same realization and that is that the source of education for it to be any real benefit to our lives the source of education has to be higher than our own beliefs or concepts. It has to be better than our own education currently is. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what I'd like to do firstly in this process to this morning is introduce you to this concept and it's a concept that I'm going to focus your attention on the whole time because, because without understanding this particular concept you will not see the point of having a relationship with God and receiving your education from God. God, being the creator of all things, if such a God does exist, would, would obviously be the creator of all things. And also God, being the creator of love, would also then know and understand more about love than anyone else. Wouldn't God? And if that is the case, then the best person to get an education from, the best being to get an education from, is God. It doesn't make sense for you to attempt to get an education from any other source. Because it's God that is going to be able to educate you about what love is, what, love, the, the, God, what God knows love to be, how God created love to be, and so forth. These things can only be given to you by God. Now, what I realised in the first century at that age was that, is that once I understood that particular thing, that actually it was pointless at trying to get an education from any other source, I focused more of my attention on how to get an education from God, what, what, what was involved, the process of getting an education with God, from, from God directly. And this became the, my endeavour for, for the rest of my life. 
to, to understand that particular process. And by the time I was 18 years of age, I understood the process very well as to how to receive this education from God. And then my next goal after that was to become what I now know to be the condition of becoming at one with God in terms of love. And that took me from the age of 18 to the age of 31 to do. And once I'd done that, I could then share that truth with the world. Now, obviously, I tried to share that truth before I became at one with God, but less people listened to me at that time. And very few people wrote anything about it. And in fact, it's not even recorded in, my, in most of history, that period of my life. But, but obviously, I did a lot of travelling around. I, I finished up leaving home when I was 21 years of age. And uh, due to what I'd classify as a number of events that were quite difficult for my family and myself to handle, so I, I left home. And, and from the age of 21 to 31, I firstly lived for, the, for seven years by myself, and then, and then for three years in the Sea, well, the, the Galilee, Ga, the sea of Galilee side uh, town of Capernaum. And, and during that process, I focused on this education I was receiving from God through that, through the, all of those peri periods of my life. So while I was being educated and my father finished up uh, giving up uh, some part of the education of me using other methods because I was quite resistive by this stage to being educated from any other source, <laughs> which also meant um, I, was, I was open to being educated uh, with regard to the use of my hands and so my father found he could educate me as a, as a carpenter um, but, but he had a lot of trouble educating me as the Messiah <laughs> from his perspective and, and so he really struggled with that process and we had quite a lot of well, I suppose nowadays you would call arguments but I was, I was just firmly st in my position as my my beliefs had been quite established by this education with God, whereas I could see my father's beliefs were quite opposing the education from God. And so we, were, we would often enter the state where we could not agree. And once some traumatic events happened to me when I was 21 years of age, um, which almost involved me dying, but, but, but ended up with my legs broken and my hip broken and a number of other parts of my body badly damaged, um, my father was so, so much in agreement with the damage that had been done to me because he felt like I needed to learn a lesson that I basically felt the need to leave home and, and, and I didn't return home very frequently at all um, after that point. And, and it was only after I became one with God that my family, particularly my mother and some of my brothers, began to listen to what I was saying. <laughs> The reason why I sta stated that particular process is that I wanted to emphasise to you this underlying point, and that is that unless you understand the truth of that statement, that, that you must get educated from a person who knows more than you do about any subject matter, unless you understand that, you are not going to make much progress in your education in love at all. The majority of you are still accepting the world's education in love. You are still accepting how the world defines love to be. And because you're accepting that and you're not connecting, and we'll talk about later why you're not connecting, but you're not connecting to the higher source of education. Because you're not doing that, you don't understand a lot of what I'm saying to you at this time. Because you, you, you think you know love but you only know the world's definition of love. You don't know God's. Right? And unless you get educated directly from God, you will not know God's education in love, what, how God wants to explain love to you to be. Natalie? Could you describe a little bit um, how it felt when you were communicating with God? Like, like how... Natalie, I could describe it, but unless you do it, you're not going to understand the explanation very well. So, so my, my focus of this particular course with you is to help you get to do it. And then you'll understand the process. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's, it's only things that we finish up doing and, and, uh, and can repeat doing that we finish up understanding what the process actually is. You follow? Yep. Just pass it forward. Um, hi, Ed Jay. Um, 
I was just wondering why there's not more people who are naturally born with this desire to actually connect with God because it, you've made it sound like it was very easy for you to, it's like it was just already there and I'm like why wasn't it just already there for me? Well you guys don't understand how easy it is for you either and this is part of our problem. Part of the reason why we don't understand is because the world doesn't believe in it. And when the world doesn't believe in it and you accept the world's definitions of things, then it means that you come to not believe it. Now, in our next conversation, we're going to talk about all the reasons why you don't believe in it and why that process doesn't happen for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we'll leave that, the answers to that to our, next, to our next presentation, not the one after we've got this one and then we've got another presentation and then we'll have a Q&A, but the very next presentation that we'll do, we'll discuss this, these reasons why we don't. Did you have something special about you that made you... No, you the, no there's many others now who have entered the same state, so no, I don't feel that I did have anything special. I did, I did of course, have the... I didn't have... The only thing I had removed at the time of my birth was, was the low worth that the majority of us have that causes us, causes us to absorb the world's definition of love and desire that definition more than any other definition. But I, we can get rid of that. I find it very concerning. Can I just stop you now? Person. You're being very needy now again, okay. and we need to move on. Who had a question over here? Thanks, Jennifer. Um, would you say that your experience, you, the things that you experience grew from one experience to the next? Of course. My faith became established through a process, which we'll talk about, actually. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. So, so here we are. We've got, we've got this higher source. So that's the source. This is where we need to gain our education from. Are we agreed on that? <laughs> and you see the logic of that. The necessity of that, because because the world, the source of the world, the world's education. So if we we accept what we currently have, which is the world's definition and education of love, if we accept that, what's going to end up is that we'll never rise higher. This is us here. I'm never going to rise higher than that source, and that's another illustration that I came to give in the first century, and that is, a river never flows to a point that's higher than its source. And it's the same thing. It's like the blind leading the blind is a similar kind of illustration. The blind leading the blind means that if a person is, uh, doesn't understand love themselves, how can they educate you in what love is? They can't, can they? And a river flowing higher than its source, well, that's impossible from a gravity perspective, obviously. And so, and so it's very, very similar with regard to the flow of love and the flow of truth and the flow of information. The flow of love, truth and information has to come from a source that's higher than yourself. Because if it's a source that's the same place as you are, then in the end it's not going to be any better than what you have. Does that make sense? <coughs> yep, if we come down to bend down the front, thanks. Keep your hand up. Um, did you know that it was love and truth that you had to learn about, or did you learn that at, at that young age? Um, it's a good question, Ben. At the time when I was very little, no, I didn't. All I could feel was this benevolent being uh, communicating with me. I knew it was benevolent because I could also feel the malevolent beings communicating with me. It was very different to that. So. So, you know, all I could feel was the difference between the amount of feeling, positive, or you could say, feelings coming from the benevolent being compared to the negative feelings coming from others. And, and the, the, the spirits who were around me, none of them were celestial spirits, of course, but the spirits who were around me at the time, there were a combination of benevolent and malevolent ones, you know, people who were evil and people who were good. And you could feel quite strongly as a child, particularly the difference between those two types of people. And then you just put the labels on it afterwards? Sort of. Yeah, then I put the labels on it afterwards. In fact, in fact, much of what you now know as divine truth come from labels that I finished up putting on things to try and describe the process, if you like. 
But until you go through the process, you won't sort of understand the process. And this is what we need to look at why we resist this process, which is go we're going to look at in our next conversation. Graham, thanks. Um, how much of this communication both ways and with, was in words? Well, it was always in words and feelings from myself um, until, of course, I was told to you know, keep my mouth shut. Um, but, but not in words from the other source, no. From the source was always feelings. Always feelings. Yep. And words would pop into my head as a result of the feelings. So it makes sense, words that I understood at the time. Now, obviously, when I was little, there wasn't too many words I understood, so, you know, but as I grew, I understood more words, and so therefore more words would come. Yeah. Did the dark spirits ever coerce you to do, like, did they ever threaten you to do things? Like, did you ever get a fear that maybe you should do what they told you to do? Of course, they did the same to me as what they do to you. Yep, certainly. Yep. I was threatened constantly from the time I could see them right the way through to my death. And, and you never... It didn't scare you enough to do that, so you just went to the loving being? Well, at the time, uh, you know, you, you, the way you process feelings is that if you feel fear, you just feel it straight away, right? So there were times when I was afraid, but I just felt it straight away. What you do with your fear is you store it up. So then it gets carried into the next event and so forth. But I, I learnt that I had just all I had to do is keep feeling my feelings and things would go past. But we'll talk about that too later in this session. Yep. So here we are, we're, getting, we're desiring this education from the higher source, right? This is what we want. Very, very important. We need this education to be from a higher source because if we don't get it from a higher source, we are going to get exactly what we've already got. Right? We're the blind leading the blind, falling into pits all the time. That's where we're at. And unless we get an education from this higher source directly, then, then really there's no chance of that changing. Now, for many of you, you still don't trust me very much, right? Most of you, in fact, don't. And, and that's okay. Like, but, but at the end of the day, if you don't trust hearing about issues of love from a person who, who obviously seems to know more about it than you yourself do, then, of course, you're going to really struggle hearing from the real source of love from this being, aren't you? Because there must be reasons why that's the case, and we'll analyse some of those reasons in the next day or two. So there's two issues now that we've, we've, we've talked about, basically. The first one is that we need to make sure that the source of education <coughs> is higher than we ourselves. We need to make sure of that. It is pointless listening to people who don't have a higher education in that particular field that you're listening to them on than you do. Because in the end, you're not going to learn anything. Right? You should be the one up there <laughs> talking to other people under those circumstances. So this is the thing. We need to make sure the source is higher than our own condition. All right? Now, that of course requires a fair degree of humility, doesn't it? It requires... Uh, a lack of arrogance, and arrogance is a major problem many of us have. We, we believe what we know to be true as true. We believe it to be true, but it's only what we believe to be true. It's only the world's education of what the world believes is true most of the time, and so therefore it's highly doubtful that it's true. Given also the fact, if we look at the results of it, and the pain and suffering that is going on in the planet right in this very day, Right? And even your own pain and suffering physically and emotionally that's going on right this very day, we can see that having these sets of beliefs are not helping humanity at all. And in fact, for the majority, uh, we, we, we would, if we had any concept of cause versus effect, we would actually see that actually the effect of these belief systems that we believe to be true and that we believe to be loving is obviously very painful and a lot of suffering. So, so if that's the case, then the cause can't be very loving. And so we need to understand this relationship between cause and effect. We'll talk about that a bit later too. But here we are, we need to go for a higher source. 
that higher source has a definition of love. The high source has a definition of love. Now, what I'm going to propose to you, that it being a higher source, you would assume that the definition of love varies greatly from the definition of love that we actually have, that we actually believe to be true. Now, this is, for the majority of you, the major problem. You still keep defining love the way the world defines it. As a result, when it comes to God's love, you're going to feel lots of different things, but mostly disappointment, because God does not define love the same way as the world does, and you want God's love to be defined the same way as the world does. And we'll talk about that as to why that's the case later as well. But this is the issue. We need to also come to accept this source's definition of love. That is going to mean giving up our own definition of love. And that's going to be a potentially painful process because most of us are addicted to holding on to this definition of love that is out of harmony with what I would classify with peace and, and joy and, and love itself, happiness. In fact, if we look at the world's definition of love, it's created a lot of pain and suffering. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, lots of pain and suffering has been created by the world's definition of love. So it's quite obvious we need to change our own definition of love. Now that's quite difficult, isn't it? Because we have a very fixed definition of love before we begin based on what's happened to us in the world. And, and we believe that to be true when it's not true. Not only do we believe it to be true, we have an emotional investment in it being true. And the main reason why we have that is because we have associated our worth with what we now know. Do all of you get that? What you've done is you've joined what you think you know as, as a measure of your value as a person. So what, what, you've, what you've done inside of yourself emotionally is you believe your value as a person is measured by what you know. Now, if what you know is completely false from God's perspective, from the higher source's perspective, then can you see whenever you receive something that, something that you don't know, you're going to see it as an attack on your worth. This is how many of you respond to truth. You see, you see truth as an attack on your worth because you've become invested between what you know and what you're worth and you've joined the two together. Now... Now, when I say you've done that, for the majority of you, it's not you that necessarily has done that. It's, it's the education system we have on this planet that has done that. The education system on this planet is basically punitive or rewarding only, and it's based upon how you perform. It's based upon measuring you constantly and how you perform based on what you know. It's got nothing to do with love at all. It's got everything to do with what... You, what kind of head knowledge you can, you can absorb and regurgitate. That's all that's got anything to do. And so, so you then become addicted to this concept that the more head knowledge I have, the more I know, the more I'm worth something, the better I am as a person. Not true. From God's perspective, a child, a baby in the arms who knows nothing is just as worthy, <laughs> has just as much worth as you do. So that, what does that tell me? That tells me that God, from God's perspective, God doesn't care what you know. <laughs> That's what it tells me. You're still worth something whether you know nothing or everything. Now knowing everything from God's perspective is also an impossibility for you. Because then you'd be God, right? And only God knows everything. So get used to not knowing much. It's okay. And also... It's not associated with your worth. So when you hear things that are beyond what you know and understand, do not believe that your worth is getting attacked, because it's not. It's just new knowledge, new truth being presented to you. That's all. all right? And you're still worth as much as you ever were, no matter how much you know. 
from God's perspective. So this is part of the God's definition of love, in fact, that worth is not equal to what you know. God loves you and thinks you're worthy even if you know nothing. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Of course, feeling that in the world in which we live is very difficult because the world in which we live basically is saying to you, unless you know something, you're not worth very much. And the world tells you that until you're dead. Many of you now believe that to be true, that you're not worth very much because you don't know much. Many of you will listen to people who are totally unloving just because, because they tell you they know more. Many of you do that too. In other words, you'll be emotionally manipulated through this, this thing that's been established in your childhood, this belief that worth equals knowledge, you are now often getting emotionally manipulated by people who are presenting that to you constantly. The more you know, the more you're worth, the more value you have. And it's not true. So that, bearing that in mind, you can see what we're attempting to do with these sessions with you. What we're attempting to do, number one thing that we need to attempt to do, is to help you connect to the source of all knowledge and all truth and all love. We need to do that. Because without doing that, everything that you can potentially learn is only what the world has already learnt. You can't learn anything more from anybody who's at the same level as you are or in a similar state than you are. So at the end of the day, you're just going to know what the world has known for thousands of years. And, you know, as the world progresses in its collective knowledge, so too will you. But that's a long-winded process. And not only that, it has caused so much pain and suffering already. Surely we've got to find a different way of getting educated, particularly when it comes to our education in love. Right. So having this realisation is very important. This realisation that God is the source of my education. It then becomes imperative that I connect to this source somehow so that I can get educated. That, that needs to be my focus. And also I need to forget about what I currently know as if it's got anything to do with what my value is because from God's perspective, your value is immensely high. You are the pinnacle of God's creation, whether you're a baby in arms who knows nothing or whether you're in a 70 or 80 year old adult who knows very little more <laughs> than nothing. From God's perspective. Yeah? Well, you think about it. An infinite being must know a lot, right? So obviously we know very little, even when we're 70 or 80 years of age. 2,000 years of age, you still know very little. Isn't that, is that disappointing? <laughs> well, not really, because, because God's created this beautiful process in us that we will always, once we get rid of this worth linking to knowledge, we will become passionate about discovery again. See, see, many of you have lost your passion of discovery of truth. When you were a little tiny child, it was beaten out of you a lot of the times. And if not beaten out of you, it was ostracized out of you, ridiculed out of you, and a number of other things, the techniques that are used to pull you into line with the world's definition. And from God's perspective, you need to rediscover that. You need to rediscover this joy of finding out. Right? And, and the beauty of rediscovering that is you have that for the rest of your existence. 2,000 years' time, you'll still have it. 10,000 years' time, you'll still have it. You'll still be discovering new things, finding out new things. The most rapid way, of course, for you to do so is by connecting to the source of this knowledge and information. So, we want to make sure that we are willing to address the fact that our definition of love is probably severely flawed. We also need to address the issue that unless we get an education from a higher source with love, then it's highly likely that any education we receive is not going to have very much long-term benefit to us. So that's what we need to understand. 
Now, what we've tried to do with this program, which goes over, last night I said to you, it's over 250 hours of information that you'll be presented with. What we're trying to do with this program is to introduce you, firstly, to the reasons why you find it difficult to connect to the source, to actually go through the process of connecting to the source, to work through all the things that prevent you from connecting to that source, and then eventually, hopefully, you get to the point where you do connect to the source and are able to be educated by God directly. That make sense? So all we're attempting to do is to educate you with regard to the how to do that, because God has the ability to educate every one of God's children as long as the child is open to such education and what the world has done is shut you down from the education process that God designed that's what it's done it's shut you down from being educated from the source and so what we've got to do is reverse that damage reverse the process that occurred through that through that damage that's what we've got to do. We've got to address that as an issue. So what we're doing is this. We're do it firstly looking at this issue of developing my will to love. So that's this week. That's 30 or so hours of material this week. The next presentation after this is developing my loving self. So right there we're going to look at all of the things that prevent you from, from actually being open to the source. You follow? And you already know that your addictions do that, your facade does that, but also the lack of desire to connect to the real you does that too. Many of you have given up, completely given up, the concept of God creating a perfect you that you could, connect, you, you could be connected with. You've given that up because that, that's not the world's definition of love and that's not the world's definition of you. And if you... And if you go down that track of accepting that definition, you are now going to be in disharmony with the world. And most of you are addicted to being in harmony with the world. So, so it's going to be a difficult process to come to terms with how to develop my loving self. Then what we need to do is examine God's laws. So we're going to have a section on understanding God's laws. The reason why we're doing that is because the majority of you have little understanding of God's laws at this point. And if you really do understand God's laws properly, then you won't engage in a whole lot of pointless exercises only to be disappointed. Right? So we'll talk about understanding them. So the first part of the process is to actually educate ourselves about what those laws do. And there are some laws, the majority of you don't realise this, there are some laws that have no negative side effects at all. In fact, the majority of God's laws have no negative side effects at all. They only have positive outcomes. So you know how you're used to the law of compensation, which has a negative side effect. When you break, a, break the law, it has a painful re recurrence. It's like we're also used to the physical laws, like the law of gravity. When you fall off a building too high, you know, you hurt yourself. That's a, what we feel is a painful effect of the law. But there are some laws that have no painful effects whatsoever. And the reality is the majority of you have no interest in those laws and are not engaging them. And so we need to get some education there. Does that make sense? Yeah. I won't, I've just got a few more things to say. We, can, we then go into the issue of sin. And we look at the issue of sin. We look at firstly understanding what it is, missing the mark of love, because we need to know what love is and what love isn't, don't we? If we're going to get educated in love, We've got, we got to see that a lot, often what we believe love to be right now is completely the opposite to what it really is. And then we've got to accept this new definition of love from the source. So that's going to mean feel, understanding what God's definition of sin is versus our own definition. Right? Then we need to understand how to remove sin. Sin being the impedience to receiving more education in love and then we go to understand how to engage more of God's laws and then we're going to understand how to actually receive love from God once we understand those basic principles we can actually go about receiving love from God and then also giving our love to God these are the things that we'll be covering with you 
over two and a half year period. And it's going to take most of you those two and a half years to even get to understand what we're talking about. If, if you apply yourself. Right? That's our goal and that's what, how we've designed this program for you. But what I'd like you to take away from this discussion is this sim two simple facts. One, we must get educated by a higher source than ourselves and than the world in general. We must, if we're ever going to be educated in love. Number two is the world's definition of love, which also unfortunately is our own definition of love, has to change. If we're ever going to be free of pain and suffering that the world currently has, we need to change what we do. And many of us are very resistive to that process. Very resistive. So we need to address the reasons why we're resistive. So what we're going to be doing over the next two days is focusing your attention on analysing the current state. You follow? You need to know where you currently are when it comes to using your will in particular. You need to know where you currently are before you can change anything. Then the next two days after that, we'll be looking at, looking at all the reasons why we resist using our will in a positive direction to love. Because we need to examine what our resistances are before we can change them. And then the last two days, we're going to look at primarily at how to engage your will positively and the rewards of doing so. And hopefully by the end of this week, you'll have some information at your fingertips that, are, that you're able to then apply in your day-to-day -day life, which will help you to engage your will more positively. Because what we've noticed is that over years and years of speaking to groups of people, very few people ever really engage their will on a daily basis to grow in love. And this is why we feel it's the most important thing for you guys right now to learn. How to really fully engage your will to love with, with no resistance. What, what to do about your resistance even. How do you go about removing from yourself this resistance. So that's our goal over the next week. So hopefully you'll enjoy that goal or that process. But what we're going to do now is have a short break. It's going to only be five minutes or so, if we can make it five minutes or so. And then what we'll do is we'll look at this issue of our, some of our analyse, what we need to do to analyse our, our will to love. All right? Thanks.